so in my last lecture i discussed about hilbert matrix and approximating uh, a function using a polynomial function m third order polynomial function and what we saw that we get uh, this hilbert matrix which for large order polynomial is highly ill conditioned difficult to invert uh, well the problem is not different if i just uh, passingly mention see yesterday we saw that we had this function ft uh, which belong to set of continuous functions and then uh, maybe we took some specific uh, thing here 0 to 2 pi and then ut which is function ut which is this and then we had this approximation and then we wrote a normal equation and said that uh, particularly when you when you when you pick this to be a polynomial that is when you pick this to be alpha 0 uh, plus alpha 1 t plus alpha 2 t square for this particular case i showed that you end up into this hilbert matrix and this hilbert matrix is is trouble inverting so in principle though you get an equation you cannot you cannot uh, solve it properly because of ill conditioning now ill conditioning of a matrix will formally define a little later uh, right now uh, all that i would tell you is that uh, the eigenvalues of this matrix or singular values of the matrix to be very precise uh, singular values are eigenvalues of a transpose a eigenvalues or singular values of this matrix uh, the smallest one and the largest one are far apart and that causes problems in computations now this is when you are trying to approximate the entire function suppose you know suppose you know this function instead of instead of uh, you know, knowing the function knowing the entire function what it is and trying to approximate it using uh, a polynomial suppose you know this function values you don't know the function but that is a more practical problem in engineering you just know function values at different points so t1 this is t2 and so on so tk and in general you know value of this function at several points so these values will be u1 u2 uk un okay u1 u2 uk un and then you know at each point you will write this equation that is uh, approximation or ut uti is equal to alpha 0 plus alpha 1 ti plus up to alpha m ti to power m you get these equations uti is nothing but ui this is this is nothing but ui so uti ui okay this plus error i okay and i going from 1 to up to n you have these equations we have done this earlier okay and we get this matrix a matrix so we will get this huge a matrix uh, so this will be 1 1 1 t1 t1 sorry t1 t2 tn up to t1 raised to m t n raised to m and alpha 1 alpha 0 alpha 1 alpha m is equal to u1 u2 un 
In this case, you have this equation. You are trying to fit a lower order polynomial, say 10th order polynomial, and this n here, number of data points is let's say 1000. So you have tried to put a 10th order polynomial in 1000 points. Okay, you have lot, you have, you know this function value at large number of points. Simple example, CP versus temperature. Okay, I know CP values at many many temperatures in some range. I am trying to fit. I am trying to correlate. I'll get something like this. There, T T will be temperature. Okay, in that case, and then U1, U2 will be CP values, and of course you have this uh, error coming up here. So this error one, error two, error n. This vector will add here. So this is my A matrix. This is my A matrix. Okay, so my A matrix, and we have solved this problem. We know that the solution, the least square solution, the least square solution is given by the least square solution that is alpha least square is A transpose A, or I'll write it in a little different way. So this is A transpose A alpha least square. Well, I think we named this as theta, right? In the earlier, uh, this thing we have called is theta. So let's keep calling it theta. So theta least square, theta least square, is equal to a transpose u. U is all the values of dependent variable which you know. Okay, we know this. Now, this, as I told you is nothing but the Hilbert matrix, this is nothing but the Hilbert matrix. Uh, so, so this actually what you can show that this matrix, this matrix uh, in this normal equation will tend to Hilbert matrix, this is not Hilbert matrix. In the earlier case it we directly got the Hilbert matrix. If you have a large number of data points, okay, what you can show is that this matrix, this matrix, the proof is just given here, I am not going to write it down on the board this matrix will tend to Hilbert matrix. So for large values of see A transpose A this tends to this tends to 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 by m, 1 by 2, 1 by 3, 1 by 4, Okay, for large number of data points here. Okay, this particular matrix A transpose A. Okay, you can look for the arguments here. Uh, this matrix will tend to this matrix, which means you know, uh, basically, if you want a good approximation, what will you do? If you want a good approximation, you will take more data points, which is logical. Okay, if you take instead of taking you know 100 data points, if you take 500 data points, you'll get a better approximation. Okay get a better approximation but uh, as you as you take more data points and try to fit the polynomial this matrix a transpose a will tend to the hilbert matrix and hilbert matrix is difficult to invert because this is a ill conditioned matrix because this is a ill conditioned matrix we have a problem that uh, we cannot uh, get reliable estimates of theta okay we will not get reliable estimates of theta and because we cannot get reliable estimates of theta approximation that you develop say 10th order or 12th order is not uh, a reliable uh, you know is not a reliable polynomial approximation. A better way here would be to use orthogonal polynomials. Instead of using orthogonal polynomials we will make this matrix there are slightly different ways of constructing orthogonal polynomials for the discrete uh, data case. Uh, which are discussed in the notes. So I am leaving it for you to read but the idea is that if you use orthogonal polynomials then this difficulty can be avoided. There is something that uh, we already have discussed is uh, how do you how do you use least square approximation for fitting certain kind of uh, uh, correlations in uh, chemical engineering. We discussed about Sherwood number correlation or we discussed about uh, Prandtl number and you know Nusselt number equal to 
will not slumber, rest to something. And if you if you take a transformation, then you can linearize that problem, and then solve the problem of estimating, uh, you know, constants in this correlations using linear least square. So that we have already seen. So we have already seen one application of linear least square in approximation. Okay. So uh, right now, right now, when I'm doing CP as a function of temperature. I am trying to approximate a continuous function using a polynomial function. This is one common application. You have some algebraic static map and then you are trying to approximate using some other some other known functions and the problem is transformed to uh, estimating this theta okay. and uh, we also saw in any general Hilbert space how you could uh, construct the normal equation. I am uploading extra problems today for these squares and uh, so you can start looking at the problems where you will see a lot of engineering applications where you can you will be using this these squares. Now one of the things that uh, I promised you is that we will now move on at some point to uh, solving boundary value problems or partial differential equations using this method. Well that is what I am going to do next that is uh, see how I can apply this method for solving a partial differential equation. So now I am going to use the ideas of least square for constructing a solution of a boundary value problem. Okay. So right now I am going to restrict uh, here to showing you two methods. One is method of least squares for a partial for a boundary value problem. I will not uh, show explicitly an example of partial differential equations. Uh, I will also talk about uh, a variant of it called Gelarkin's method. Now these two methods though uh, we will be uh, looking at them very briefly right now. We are not going to look at the details of this beyond a point because these methods become very very complex and what actually uh, uh, you know uh, this is actually we are getting into the method of finite element. Okay. If you have to actually implement this, you have to get into method of finite element and finite element methods uh, are fairly complex when it comes to computer implementation. So it will go beyond the scope of this particular course. You know, I have to stop at some point problem discretization and move on into uh, you know solution techniques. So I am just going to give you very very brief introduction, not really uh, complete introduction, but at least the philosophy of this uh, problem discretization that is say boundary value problem. How do you discretize this using least squares approach? Philosophy will be clear. We will not go into the details. Okay. So details will be, uh, I mean if I have to get into details, it will take many lectures and uh, we have to move on and do other things other than just problem discretization. Okay. But this, this once we do this, uh, you know it sort of completes the picture. We have three different ways of problem discretization. One is uh, problem in this particularly here I am referring to boundary value problems or partial differential equations. We discretize using Taylor series approximation. We discretize using second is interpolation. We got collocation methods. Okay. Third is this least squares. Okay. We get this finite element method. First is finite difference. Do not confuse. Finite difference method. Then we had orthogonal collocations. Then we also had orthogonal collocations on finite elements, okay. And this method, but that that basically is interpolation based method. And the third one is this least squares method. Interpolation, we want a polynomial to pass through every point, okay. That is a difference. Approximations, we are trying to fit a polynomial in some least square sense. We don't want the polynomial to pass through every point or the function to pass through every point, okay. So let's look at uh, this method of least squares for solving. So this method is called as minimum residual method and uh, well why can you can you solve a problem using optimization and just to give you a, a little bit of a background before I move into least squares. Okay. Uh, we will revisit what I am doing right now on the board again, but I am just uh, uh, preempting something. See, we, we know how to solve uh, a x equal to b, 
right now from your undergraduate how do you solve ax equal to b gaussian elimination the best method you know is gaussian elimination you do you know uh, triangularization and then solve in the reverse direction so that's one of the most efficient methods that we know can i use the ideas of optimization to solve this problem okay now let's see whether we can use the ideas of optimization to solve this problem what we wanted in optimization we want to minimize something okay and the minimum the minimum should be the solution okay now let me take this let me take this before i get into this let me let me say that i want to solve ax equal to b i want to solve ax equal to b okay uh i want to solve this exactly okay i could i could say that well this problem is like saying that you know let me define an error vector let me define an error vector which is ax minus b ax minus b everyone with me on this okay and then i'll define an scalar objective function okay i'll define a scalar objective function so my scalar objective function is going to be now well what i am going to do now is very very similar to what is happening here so this is my uh, error vector this is a theta and this is u except in this particular case in this particular case we had uh, you know uh, this matrix a was tall matrix it was not a square matrix right now what i'm writing there is a square matrix okay square matrix so i want to solve square matrix problem by optimization is it possible <coughs> okay so now let me formulate an objective function phi which is e transpose e transpose e I formulate an objective function e transpose e, and then what I do is, which is what is e transpose e? A x minus b transpose A x minus b. Okay, and now I say that well, minimize phi with respect to x. How do you get the minimum? First derivative equal to zero, right? So do phi by do x is equal to zero. Can you solve this? What will you get? If I solve this, if I use the rules of differentiation of a scalar function phi, is phi a scalar function? Phi is a scalar function, right? i am differentiating a scalar with respect to a vector we have looked at the rules of differentiation of a scalar with respect to a vector if i use those rules what i will get is this equation a transpose a x is equal to a transpose b i will get a transpose a x minus a transpose b is equal to 0 this is the equation that i will get if I differentiate and set derivative of phi equal to 0, I will get this equation. Okay? Is this fine? Just, just see this. You will get, if you, if you, if you expand this, you will get a transpose, you will get x transpose, a transpose a x. Then you will get uh, a transpose, x transpose into b. You will get four terms. You will get one term which is b transpose b. B is not function of x. B do do b transpose b by do x is zero. Okay. So uh, if you differentiate, you will you will very easily arrive at this particular equation. Okay. I just want to show that this is same as this is same as a transpose a x minus b is equal to zero. Okay. Now. If a 
if matrix A is non-singular, if matrix A is non-singular, okay, when will this be equal to 0? Ax minus b equal to 0, okay. So actually by solving this optimization problem, by solving this optimization problem, you have solved, you have reached the solution of Ax equal to b and later at some point, we are going to see a method for solving Ax equal to b using optimization, an iterative procedure which is faster in arriving at a solution many times, then uh, is this is this the optimum? Why is this the optimum? Why is this minimum? If you take second derivative, what will you get? A transpose A. A transpose is always a symmetric matrix. Whatever is A, A transpose is a symmetric positive definite matrix. Very nice matrix. Okay. So, we have reached the minimum. Okay. Uh, Okay, so this is, so I can actually formulate a problem of solving Ax equal to b as an optimization problem. Yeah. This will be exact solution. Okay. Earlier we saw approximate solution. So, in the situation where, in the situation where, you know, A is a tall matrix, okay, which means A is a non-square matrix. It is, it has more number of rows than the columns, okay, then you will get the least square solution. When you, when, when A is a, uh, you know, square matrix, invertible square matrix, this will give you exact solution. This will give you exact, look at, look here, no? this will give you exact solution. If A is invertible, when can you solve that problem Ax equal to B when A is invertible? If A is not invertible, you cannot solve that problem, right? So now we are starting with the assumption that A is invertible, okay, and we want to solve the problem. So this, this obviously gives me the solution if I, if I, if I do this. Okay, so optimization could be a route to arrive at a solution of a particular problem. Okay, what I'm going to do for what I'm going to do for uh, the case of uh, boundary value problem is more similar is similar to the case where A is tall. Okay, so A is non-square. What I'm going to do for boundary value problem is qualitatively similar to A being non-square, that is A has more number of rows than the columns, okay. It is possible to do at least formulate the problem to get an exact solution of a, a boundary value problem using optimization and that discussion is, is included here in the notes under the name of Raleigh Ritz method. It is very, very nice. You should read this uh, section, though I am not going to do it on the board. Uh, it takes a lot of time and this actually forms the foundation of finite element method and finite element methods are very, very useful in solving uh, partial differential equations. So I would say there are these two competitors, finite difference is very easy to understand, but finite difference is not so efficient because you need large number of grid points, okay. Two methods that are competing good methods. Uh, you know, which balance between computational efficiency and uh, good solutions, give you a good, good balance of these two things are orthogonal collocation, collocation interpolation based methods or this finite element methods. Uh, so now let us let us move on to uh, boundary value problem, okay. Now I want to consider a specific uh, problem here, boundary value problem. So there is some operator L which is operating on uz, okay. I suppose now you are familiar with these kind of things because you are, most of you are attending the other course on mathematics, mathematical methods and uh, you have looked at uh, these kind of problems, right. L operating on z, u of z uh, is equal to, this, I, this is equal to some fz and boundary condition 1, this corresponds to u0 is equal to 0 and bc2 is equal to u1 is equal to 0. So, this is a classical boundary value problem that you get uh, when you are solving a partial differential equation. This will typically yield, if you solve it exactly, if you know the solution exactly, it will yield the Eigen function, Eigen function expansions. Are you doing Eigen function expansions? Yeah, so this will yield the eigenfunction expansions. Right now, 
my mandate is not to solve it exactly my mandate is to solve it approximately okay I am going to solve it. Now here I am assuming that uh, L is a uh, differential operator which is operating on uh, U conceptually we are not doing anything different than A x equal to B and we have talked about it right. So this is a this is equivalent to operator A x equal to B we are trying to find out inverse problem classic inverse problem. So right now I am not interested in the exact solution I am interested in some approximate solution to this problem and I am going to hypothesize a solution approximate solution u cap z is equal to alpha 1 okay I am going to hypothesize a solution now what are these u1 u2 u3 these are some known functions these could be simple polynomial if you want it that way but you know polynomials is not a good choice okay this could be Legendre polynomials shifted Legendre polynomials it could be sine and cos it depends upon how you choose these functions uh, it, it's, it's uh, up to you and you have to choose this function such that the boundary conditions are met of course uh, so I have this functions which I have chosen here uh, let us assume that So let us assume that we have chosen these functions for the time being okay that such that at the two ends they satisfy the boundary conditions okay we have chosen the functions such that at two boundary points you satisfy the boundary conditions okay. Uh, so you have to choose the choose these functions in this particular case carefully. Now what I am going to do is I am going to define this residual I am going to define this residual okay the, the, the terms used are little different but the meaning is same in uh, least square parameter estimation we call this error vector okay here we call residual vector okay residual is between left hand side and the right hand side okay so the residual is between l u z minus f z this is my error vector in the case of finite dimensional least squares what did we do how did we find the minimum sum of the square of errors was minimum what was actually sum of the square of errors 2 norm square what is 2 norm square inner product of the vector with itself right inner product of vector with itself so for the finite dimensional case for the finite dimensional case we had this just keep this in the background in the finite dimensional case we wanted to obtain theta so theta least square was minimum with respect to theta you know inner product of error and error right sum of the square of errors least square estimation error vector was where error was defined as a theta u minus a theta right just keep this in the background okay I just want to do the exactly same thing here for this particular problem now I have this I have this functions I have this functions u1 u2 u3 so what I am going to do is I am going to pose this problem okay I am going to pose this problem as minimize I am I am skipping the algebra which can be a little bit tedious I will write the final expressions but whatever we have done till now from that you can very easily derive what I am doing if I if I if I have to do uh, the same thing uh, here I will have to write this as summation of these functions and then uh, start working with those summations and the expression will become complex but that is just an algebra the concept is exactly identical so you should not uh, so what are the unknown here what is the theta here what is theta here alpha values alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha m right alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha m okay 
now what is r u z i what is r u z i well you will have to substitute one by one each that is not the way to go about okay so we want here uh R Z I rather what is R Z I? What is R Z I? R Z I is L operating on summation i going from 1 to m alpha i u i u i of z i u i of z i. Uh, let me let me do a small modification here. Let me let us call this J. Let us call this J, and let us call this J. This is this is residual at. This is the residual at z equal to. This is the residual at z equal to. Z i. Okay. This is the residual at z equal to z i. Uh, well, do I need the points here? I'm not going to go same way as the grid points. I'm going to go in the I'm going to go in the parameter space directly. So what I'm going to do here is uh, instead of forcing the residual to be zero at each grid point, well, what I'm going to do here is to pose my problem as minimize with respect to theta phi theta which is equal to inner product of r r z well this is this is something different from okay you should realize this this is something different from i am not taking any grid points right now I am not taking any grid points. Okay. So what is what is this? What is the inner product? What is the inner product defined as? Inner product integral say zero to one right. Okay, now how do I get the equations from this? How do I get equations? I have to differentiate this. I have to differentiate this with respect to alpha with respect to theta, right? So, so now what I have to do is to get the solution. To get the solution, I should. See how many equations, how many unknowns are there? There are m unknowns. I need m equations. Okay. So if my phi theta is this, then what is how do you get the optimum? Dou phi by dou theta is equal to 0. Okay. So which actually means dou by dou alpha i of r. Is equal to zero for i going from one to up to m. Is this okay? Do phi by do theta equal to zero, which is same as this is my objective function error, right? This is my error error square sum of the square of errors, but it is not sum; it is the integral of error. It is integral of error, not at one point, not at few points, but over the entire domain. Okay, there is a difference you can see here between what I am getting, uh, the way I am constructing the solution, and finite uh, difference method or orthogonal collocation method. Here, uh, we are setting this with respect to equal to zero. Okay, if I 
if I solve for this, if I solve for this, okay, what do I expect to get? See, what is R Z here? So you have to you have to actually solve this problem of do by do alpha i, okay, uh, into what is this? This is uh, F Z minus summation i going from one to m alpha i u cap i, right? What is R Z? R Z is F Z minus this, right? This equal to 0 ok and this equation you have to solve for i going from 1 to up to m oh yeah l of this right, right. operator l operating on this operator l operating on it yeah <coughs> so thanks for this correction so l operating on this uh, and L operating on this and I have to take I have to take derivative and set it equal to 0 but if L is a linear operator if we make an assumption L is a linear operator okay then this alpha i will come out and then you can differentiate and solve the problem very very easily so if L is a linear operator then what I can do is if I actually write those equations and collect the terms together Okay, I will get this. I will get this equation, which looks very, very uh, similar to the normal equation. You can work out the algebra. I am just skipping it. It's just matter of doing it meticulously. You will get this equation. L u one Okay, you get this equation. If you rearrange, if you actually differentiate, do a little bit of uh, take a trouble of rearranging all the equations and then put them together, you will get this equation which looks very very similar to the normal equation. Okay, except that operator L is operating on each one of those basis functions which you have chosen. Okay, and then if I solve this, if I solve this then I will get alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha m. I am getting an approximate solution in the least square sense. Okay. There is one difference, there is one difference here between the previous methods of discretization and this method of discretization. What is that, what is the difference? Here, here these integrals are over the entire domain, not at few points. Okay. I am not evaluating this integral at few points. I am evaluating this integral over the entire domain. Okay. So, so the finite dimensional approximation comes because of the finite number of basis vectors we have taken. The finite dimension business here comes because of not because of the grid points. Okay. Not because of the grid points. Here you have constructed a solution which is not See in earlier case when you get the solution, you must have done it now for the boundary value problem which we are looking at, tram problem. It is some points right, finite, after all you get only few points. Actually you know that the solution is a continuous function. By this approach, we are getting a solution which is a continuous function. I will just take a simple example so that the ideas will become clear. Okay. Is this algebra clear? Is, it, is there any doubt about this? See here L this residual is this residual is fz minus l operating on this function okay fz minus l operating on this function we are taking l to be a linear operator okay linear differential equation uh, and then we are solving this problem uh, of um, you know estimating alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha m 
Now let's look at a specific problem. Well, this particular method will work by this way because when the operator is linear, if the operator is not linear, what do I do? We'll come to that a little later. Uh, but right now, right now we are just looking at a basis of the method which is least squares method and the operator is linear. So we get this nice. So let's look at a specific problem. Okay, that will give you better insights into Well, I want to solve this problem of my example is L u z. This is same as dou to u or d to u by d z square minus u equal to one. So this is my f z. Okay, I want to solve this problem. I want to solve this problem. This is equal to one. Okay, over the entire domain, this should be equal to one, and my boundary condition one is u zero is equal to zero. My boundary condition two is u one equal to zero. <coughs> well, u is not equal to one. Please note that u is not equal to one. You are saying that the this operator operating on u should be equal to one. Okay, don't confuse. Okay. Now, I am going to take a very very simple solution to this problem. This particular problem, you know, you must have seen uh, in the other course that this particular problem can be solved analytically. You will get uh, analytical solution. Right now, the 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 motivation is to you know convey some concept. Okay, so that is uh, more important right now. So let's take this approximate solution u cap z. Okay, so my approximate solution is alpha one sine pi z plus alpha two sine two pi z. Okay, does this satisfy the boundary conditions? Satisfies the boundary condition at at uh, zero and at one. Boundary condition is satisfied. Now I want to see if I get difference between finite difference method, okay, and this method is that if I get alpha one and alpha two, I can find out value or approximate value of the solution at every point z, not at finite number of points. You get the difference? If I can get least square estimates of alpha one and alpha two, I get okay. So now what is what is the What is the normal equation? The normal equation. So, what is my u1 cap? What is my u1 cap z? Is sine pi z. And what is my u2 cap z? Sine 2 pi z, right? Sine pi z and sine 2 pi z. These are my u1 cap and u2 cap, right? Okay. What is the normal equation? What is the normal? What is the equation that you get? Well, it normal like equation. Let me not call it normal equation because not exactly the normal equation. So, what is the equation that you will get here? How do you get alpha one, alpha two? So, this is inner product of L operating on u one, L operating on u one cap, inner product of L operating on u one. L operating on u2 cap, L operating on u2 cap, L operating on u1 cap, u2 cap, L operating on u2 cap. This matrix, okay, this matrix times into alpha one. Alpha two, this matrix time alpha one alpha two will be equal to to get alpha one alpha two. What should this be equal to? In a product of u one cap one, in a product of u two cap one.
right so what is inner product of l operating on u1 what is l so let's go back here so what i have to do what is the first inner product l u1 l u1 this is inner product 0 to 1 what is l u1 d by dz square of what is u1 sin pi z minus d2 by dz square right d2 by dz square of sin pi z minus uh, sin pi z this right so this integral I have this integral I can do I can just it is not so difficult to do this integral you have to be a little bit patient and then do these integrals okay if you work out these integrals okay uh, well I will write down what you get here actually just if you take uh, this what you can show is that L u1 this is equal to minus pi square plus 1 sin pi z you can show this very very easily you can also show what is L u2 okay and then you just have to find those integrals if you find those integrals what you sh what you see here is <coughs> you will get pi square plus 1 whole square by 2 0 0 and 4 pi square plus 1 whole square by 2 right hand side will turn out to be minus 2 pi square plus 1 by pi and 0 if I do patiently all those four integrals okay then I get this I get this equation I have chosen orthogonal basis functions here sin pi z and sin 2 pi z are orthogonal so uh, that helps me in this particular case that helps me in getting these to be 0 this comes out to be a diagonal matrix uh, and what happens here is that I get the final solution so what is the final solution if I if I compute alpha 1 and alpha 2 I get the final solution to be my solution comes out to be uh, minus 4 by pi pi square plus 1 sin pi z so which means alpha 2 comes out to be 0 alpha 1 comes out to be this and uh, this solution is pretty close to the in this particular case the true solution can be found out the true solution is the true solution is u z equal to this is the true solution this is the approximate solution true solution can be found by some different means not by this this approach yeah yeah and then force the residual to 0 so so now he, I choose uh, some of these functions from a standard basis no I can choose them from a standard basis like sine cos I could choose them from Legendre polynomials shifted Legendre polynomials I could I could have worked out this problem using shifted Legendre polynomials if I have those shifted Legendre polynomials which satisfy the two boundary conditions in this con in this particular case sine and sine functions are convenient because they satisfy the two boundary conditions they need not be orthogonal but uh, in this particular case orthogonality always helps we always work with orthogonal functions okay we try to work with orthogonal functions as far as possible orthogonality is but but this solution there is one difference between this solution and other, other solution other solution is exact at known points exact means 
it it is not exact it exactly satisfies the differential equation at known points here this solution is obeying the differential equation in the least square sense okay at every point it's not equal to zero but if you take the least square sense it is zero okay integral of the square of error is zero error is not equal to zero okay integral of the residual square is zero okay even in the other case we are forcing residual to zero only at finite points what happens to the residual at the points which are in between they will not be zero right so we are only forcing at a finite number of points even here you know you do not know which points exactly the residual will be, will be zero because but the solution will be crossing you know zero at many points so this is a, both are approximate solution this is a one way of getting approximate solution and you have other way of getting approximate solution which is what we have seen earlier okay now the problem is that in every every everywhere where you uh, where you are solving this your l will not be in general you know it will not be linear there could be a non linear uh, differential equation we are solving this tram problem right it's not a linear operator okay so what do i do what will i get what will i what how will i solve that problem so in that case you know i just use the concept of orthogonality between the subspace and the error the error, the concept that we had earlier and we'll get the method of you know uh, galarkin method so i'll discuss it briefly in my next class but the next class after doing that half an hour of uh, galarkin method something about a galarkin method i want to move on to solving problems because we are only two classes away from the end sem and then a bit sem and we'll solve some problems of least square um, so that you get better insight into uh, what is happening but the key thing here is that uh, right now i have not used polynomial approximation i have used general functional approximation the solution is obtained by posing the problem as a least square problem okay and then you are getting a solution approximate solution of the boundary value problem using least square approach okay it's possible to extend this to partial differential equations we we'll have to compute double integrals in x and y and so on okay it's possible to do that in uh, algebra will become complex the concept is not different 